cloud recording storage is full. Okay, we are recording. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm just going to continue admitting everyone. Thank you everyone for joining us. My name is Ebony Torres. I am the County Alliance Coordinator for Somerset County. And today I am taking over hosting responsibilities for our Human Services Department for Rena Johnson, Zach Berliner, and Angie Sandy. And I'm happy to be here with you today to present the reality check telling the truth about marijuana cannabis in collaboration of Central Jersey Family Health Consortium and Safe Communities Coalition of Hunterdon and Somerset, a division of prevention resources. So without further ado, I do wanna keep everyone's time in mind. We do have two wonderful presenters here with us today to talk about this important topic. And we have Debbie Rasika, who I will be spotlighting for everyone who will be giving us our first presentation, and then Jerry Covecchio for our second part of the presentation. So without further ado, take it away, Debbie. Hi, thank you. And um, thank you so much for this opportunity to speak today. Um, my portion of the program is, as we're gonna find, I'm gonna focus mostly on women and on pregnancy. Um, and I hope that that this will be informative for everybody. Okay, I do have nothing, um, no disclosure, no, no financial interest, just thought I would put that out there. And what I'm going to talk about today is, is the marijuana of today and really how dangerous it is. And identifying some maternal and fetal risks from marijuana exposure. We're also going to talk about the effects of marijuana during breastfeeding very, very briefly. So I just want to start by putting out there the faces of addiction, right? It's absolutely all of us. It's anybody. It's there is no prejudice. We all know that. And let's keep that in mind as, as we think about um, women, uh, pregnant women and substance use. Sometimes that can be a little difficult uh, to wrap around um, because of the sensitivity of it. But let's also keep in mind, no one asks to be ill with a substance use disorder. And of course, according to DSM-5, you need three or more of the following criteria for addiction to be diagnosed. And as most of us know, it's pretty devastating and pretty much life consuming. And we know it to be a fatal disease if it's not arrested um, with intervention and treatment and hopefully with good recovery supports. Okay, so what really puts um, folks at risk um, for substance use disorder? One of the biggest ones, and we're going to talk about this as we keep speaking of women and of pregnancy, is that early onset of use really is a, a tremendous risk factor um, for our young people with developing brains. So, of course, the, um, Jerry's going to talk about this. We really want to prolong that early onset. We have to remember that physical changes do occur in the brain, and it really can result in permanent loss of neurological function, meaning brain damage that cannot be undone. Um, and depending on what's going on, and if there are enough risk factors in place, we know a lot of the developmental growth can stop when a young person's using, um, and therefore they're not able to fully develop their brains and, and all the wonderful executive functions to give them some protection. And again, Jerry will go into that a lot more. Um, I do just want to highlight, um, besides family history, which is a huge risk factor for any person, um, but we also have to remember, and what we're going to focus on, is that exposure in utero. It presents uh, tremendous vulnerability for people when they reach young adulthood, as we are going to speak of. I do want to highlight young girls and women, because we are at higher risk for substance use um, than males are. And part of it is, is our motivation for using versus that of, of those who are, are um, male. Um, many women are focused on weight loss or media promotes that. Social media, there are so many pressures to be thin uh, because that's determined to be what's most attractive. Uh, stress relief. 
big, big role in substance use. Boredom, we know during COVID, substance use rose so much. Folks were at home and isolated. Boredom is a big factor. Also looking for mood enhancement and, and certainly reduction of sexual inhibition. So folks maybe can uh, feel more comfortable um, performing things that they might not want to do otherwise. We also can't forget self-medication for both depression and or anxiety, and also just improvement of self-esteem and self-image. So these are pretty intrinsic reasons um, for substance use, which often can lead to a substance use disorder. The earlier a young lady um, enters puberty, she is also at higher risk for substance use disorder. And I'm not going to get into that other than it is tied in a lot with brain growth and hormone growth and, and so many other things that make us the compl complex beings that we are. Um, those uh, women whose mothers smoke and or drank alcohol during pregnancy in any amount are at higher risk for substance use themselves at a, at a later age. Um, binging, purging, um, any kind of excessive dieting, again, um, issue of weight can also lead um, to more vulnerability for young women. Okay, um, protective factors, I'm just happy they exist. We know science is there. Jerry will focus on that more. But again, the more we can put off that uh, first onset of use and really avoid any substance use before and during pregnancy, um, we have much better outcomes for our young people. Um, there can, you know, folks, of course, who have more um, challenges environmentally, have been traumatized, have their own history of mental health issues, all of these present higher vulnerabilities for substance use. This is not to say that those that don't have these types of challenges are not at risk themselves. If they've had family history and they just happen to have the correct brain chemistry and their other risk factors really outweigh their preventive factors and allowing this disease to blossom. Okay, um, as, as we focus again specifically on women, we have to understand that women and men um, are built very differently. And for the purpose of this presentation, I am using females and males uh, because that is what our research is based on. Um, so I am not trying to eliminate um, anybody of any identity as I go through this presentation. So um, I'm trying to be as culturally sensitive as possible. So um, with that being said, focusing on women versus men, we do have a quicker onset of illness. And um, with that quicker onset, we also get sicker. And the reason for this, one of the big reasons um, to really simplify it is we have less ability to metabolize substances, particularly alcohol, uh, marijuana, if we're talking about that. And we also have a lot more fat cells than water content in our body. Therefore, we don't metabolize stuff and it hangs around longer. Um, and what happens with alcohol is we end up with a higher blood alcohol level more quickly. Therefore, the poisons are surrounding and flowing through our systems more readily and, and causing damage to our organs and our systems. With marijuana, because of our high content of, of fat cells, it really can linger a long time. And the longer it lingers, um, the quicker it is to build up tolerance and other things and use more and create more risk with risky use and for substance use order to, to set in. So we do have to remember that, that the disease in general of addiction progresses much more quickly in women than it does men. Um, and one last comment I'll make about these differences. Um, there is so much research going on right now um, determining some of those differences. They are really studying substance use now in terms of those inherent physiological, biological, environmental, all systemic um, differences between men and women. Prior to in the last decade, maybe a little longer, all research has been targeted on males. So we're finding that treatments may also be very different and therefore much more effective interventions, treatment and recovery processes. Okay. Um, 
In general, um, females do have a very difficult time when their substance use um, does turn to dependence and development of substance use disorders. Um, we, spoke, we spoke some of physical health. Um, it's also huge um, toll on our psychological functioning, as well as interpersonal issues. Relationships become so um, challenged and, and often stressful and often are not able to be maintained in a healthy way when women are actively substance using. Um, this is a generality, um, but when a male in a family um, is dealing with substance use um, issues, if there's a strong support network um, and there are females involved, it's easier to keep that support network um, there and to offer the needs um, and supports um, that are necessary. If the person who's usually the one kind of running stuff at home and handling a lot of different hats and they're the ones ill, it's tougher for their support systems to be in place. Um, and of course, occupational functioning can even uh, be impaired more quickly because we get quicker, we get sick more quickly. Um, and we must look, of course, um, at the whole picture and look at financial situations, our spiritual bankruptcy, involvement in the criminal justice system, whether as a victim or as a perpetrator, um, and often activities that are driven by that substance use disorder, um, which a wonderful reason why we do have recovery courts within our counties to help those folks who get involved uh, in criminal justice um, because of a substance use struggle. Okay, I went through that very quickly. I'm now going to go in a little bit to just what marijuana is today, and we'll get into some more issues related to uh, pregnancy and uh, breastfeeding, et cetera, um, and involvement with um, DCPMP because um, reporting for pregnant women is very important. So um, for most of us, um, we know that, that cannabis, marijuana, they're dried leaves, flowers, right, stems and seeds. And there's two types. One, you're going to hear sativa, the other indica. And they're different strains. They give you a different type of high. People have their preferences. Um, just know that you get to have a preference these days. You really can pick hybrids and all kinds of different strains and things that you might want. You can really sort of tailor-made what you're looking for. We know that the THC today, okay, that's the active ingredient that's mind altering. That's the thing that gets us high versus CBD, which we'll talk about in a little bit. But THC um, does cause um, a psychological and physical addiction. Now, in comparison to um, what was the concentration of THC measured in marijuana back in, in the 60s, 70s, 80s, it was much, much lower. Um, so much so that it was not considered by um, our science um, big institutions to be um, physiologically addictive. It was thought to be psychologically addictive, but not physically addictive. But we now know that it is physically addictive. People do build up tolerance. They, they need more of the same substance over a period of time to achieve their desired effect. If they don't have it and their body really needs it, they've progressed into a substance use disorder, they will go through physical withdrawal. Uh, pretty unpleasant, um, not that dissimilar from going through um, withdrawal from tobacco from nicotine. Uh, it is the most commonly used drug in the USA. And now with our medicinal, recreational, legal use, many mixed messages, um, and, and one of the biggest messages we'll talk about is that perception of safety. Um, a lot of use is going on, including pregnant women. More pregnant women are using than have ever used before. And we will talk about some of that. This is so approximate, you know, over 22 million users each month. Um, and we know that's so underscored. Um, how do we even measure that? Uh, we have a lot of ways to try to keep track of our youth and of our pregnant women and of people that come through any kind of health care. But we know that it is um, incredibly underreported. So we do need to remember that. Um, 
approximately one in 10 folks will become ill with a substance use disorder. And again, that that's such an approximate number because it depends on so many factors. Substance use disorder is a very complex disease and so individual um, to the person who is who is afflicted. Mostly when smoke, when folks are smoking, um, as we know, more common things like smoking a joint, which is a hand rolled kind of cigarette. Folks are smoking out of pipes, whether they're glass, um, not many people smoke out of wood ones anymore. Um, and people are smoking out of vaporizers, which come in all shapes and sizes. And we really can do an entire presentation on vaping and the products being used to vape, um, but we're not going to get into that today because that's not really the purpose of, of today's training. Um, but I just do want to leave folks with the thought that vaporizers produce no vapor. Um, what is coming off those products, whatever they may be, are technically aerosol because something's being combusted and it's creating an aerosol, which um, marketers have called vape. Vapor needs water to be produced and there's no water in these products that we're calling vaporizers. So just an interesting fact to keep in mind. Um, that increased perception of safety, um, as I'm saying for pregnant women, it's such a high risk factor. And I'm sure Jerry's going to talk about that for our young folks. Oops, so sorry, as well. Um, and, and that's really those of us doing any type of community health work, any type of education, clinical work, uh, prevention work, recovery support work. We, we need to um, really work past that, that, that big obstacle. Okay, so back to our, mar our marijuana facts. Because of the concentration of what is in, um, what is being grown today. And we have to understand a lot of what's being grown is being grown scientifically. Hydroponically, it's being grown in water, it's being crossbred, it's being manipulated into all different forms, shapes, and sizes, which we're going to go into a little bit, each becoming more concentrated and each presenting a lot of risk inherent to themselves. But do you know that developing brains, whether we're talking about babies in utero, little ones, children, teens, um, all developing brains are real susceptible um, to a lot of adverse effects. Um, adverse effects from exposure to marijuana. Memory, learning, attention, decision-making, coordination, all of these things that develop you know, from our cortex, which is the front of our brain, which really make up our executive functions. All those skill sets that really help us negotiate through life in, in a healthy, responsible way. Those are the skill sets that really can be uh, compromised greatly with marijuana exposure. Long-term use also holds a lot of risks. And, and this is particularly true for frequent users, people who use on a regular daily chronic basis. This is not true for that social occasional person who is picking up um, something on the weekend. But do you know it's becoming harder and harder to remain a social user of these products because of their addictive nature, because of the strength of what is in them. So that's important to keep in mind as well. But those who have a predisposition to psychosis, schizophrenia, other mental health conditions like depression, anxiety, uh, struggles with suicide, suicidal thinking or attempts, those um, very serious conditions can definitely be exacerbated and, and show up earlier in a person's life with chronic long-term use of marijuana. Schizophrenia used to not show up till later um, in their 20s, particularly for our young men. And in, in our treatment settings, we're definitely um, seeing this manifest itself much earlier in age. Um, we also have to think about the physical effects because folks are using so much. Those things we imagine, like with smoking cigarettes, the respiratory stuff, heart rate, um, nausea, vomiting, dehydration, all of those things um, can become certainly an issue. Okay. Um, Again, more about marijuana and just how scary it is um, on today's market, excuse me. With it being present in foods and beverages and candies, 
um, folks are at much higher risk for, for blood poisoning. We have to be careful. This stuff, um, unless you're getting it in the dispensaries, it is not regulated. So it can say anything it wants on a package. So even if something says it's it's all that CBD, the stuff that just has all that those great benefits that, that people believe in um, and has no THC may not be true. So you use a product and unbeknownst to you, you go for um, a job interview, they ask to screen you and you're testing positive for THC, but yet you haven't even used any to your own knowledge. We have to be careful of, of what we're using. But even when things are regulated, it's very important to read your packaging because portion control is a real issue. Um, portions are very tiny. Um, most people will not stop at one or two gummy bears. You know, folks are going to eat more than that. And also folks don't understand that when you eat something, it takes two hours to digest it. You don't get the effect of, of that product until it's digested. So unfortunately, people continue to use thinking that they're not feeling anything. And um, to reach that point where you're at such toxicity with the THC in your, in your bloodstream, it, it's very miserable. And it certainly can be particularly dangerous for young people as well as pregnant women and their unborn babies. Um, it's being concentrated into all kinds of things so that it's more fun. You can make more paraphernalia to use it. It's just, you know, our wonderful um, folks out there who know how to make money and target um, young people and vulnerable people and, and all others that we've been talking about are creating all these different products. And there are so many names to everything. Uh, please never feel that you can be caught up because as soon as you become familiar with some of the terminology being used out there to describe these products, there's at least 30 more out, out there on the market. Um, and um, it, it, it's tough to keep up. Just know that it's always changing and growing. Okay. These extracts that we're talking about, this manipulation of this product um, can be up to 90 percent, even higher percentage of THC in the product, which is incredibly high and definitely neurotoxic uh, for brain development. Um, if we're smoking something that's not manipulated into products or into extracts or concentrations, we're maybe looking at 20 percent, and that's at the low end. Um, the products that you see today, they're very crystallized. And, and if you ever see that, what you're seeing is, is that high level of THC that, that's on the product, which is part of what uh, makes it so incredibly smelly. Um, if folks are using or choosing to smoke the flower rather <clears throat> than um, through these extracts and other manipulations. Okay. So this is also an important fact um, as we're thinking through the lifespan. Um, heavy marijuana use, and I have to emphasize heavy. Again, I'm not talking occasional use, but your chronic everyday user, um, even if they stop uh, many, many years before they choose to have children, their um, fertility can be impacted. Um, for men, uh, you may be um, in a position where you're producing less seminal fluid and therefore have a lower sperm count. Also, the sperm can behave abnormally because often they're not forming fully. So they're not as powerful swimmers. They're, they're not as fully formed and healthy. Um, so you're kind of losing the um, survival of the fittest and that strongest best sperm being the ones to get through to fertilize that egg um, to bring you know the best optimum conditions um, to, to that um, to that sperm meeting that egg. So that is something to think about. So even when you stop using for for many, many years, if you've been a chronic user in your younger years, you could have changed the expression of your genes in a way that it could put your offspring at risk for mental health concerns as well as substance use concerns when they reach young adulthood. Um, so we do want our young people to think about the next generation um, if, if maybe they're considering having kids. Um, ladies, we are born with all the eggs we are ever going to have. Um, and if we are using heavily, we can harden the outside of our eggs. This is particularly concerning 
One, it might be harder for us to release our eggs. Therefore, um, it is more possible for ectopic pregnancies to take place where the fertilization actually happens in the in the uh, fallopian tube. And if that bursts, that, that's life threatening to mom. So that does need to be terminated. And it certainly can impair future pregnancies if that's something that that uh, particular person is interested in. Uh, and with our eggs hardening, uh, for women who may find it difficult to get pregnant and even use um, different um, methods to try to achieve that might might find some struggles um, if they were using pretty heavily when they were younger. So uh, it's important for to be aware of your history. You know, we all do the best we can with what we know and what we do. We can't undo um, anything that's been done in our past, um, but we can certainly be mindful and it can help us make decisions um, moving forward. Okay, so now I'd like to focus more on pregnancy as, as we're trying to do through most of this presentation. Um, again, and this is so scary uh, to us who, who understand the risks of marijuana use during pregnancies, um, the perception of safety is, is particularly high. And it's a perception um, that surpasses that of cigarettes. So even women who work real hard to be able to overcome a substance use disorder uh, to nicotine during pregnancy and, and receive those services to remain nicotine free will begin using marijuana products or continue using them. Uh, unfortunately, there are a lot of mixed messages out there, uh, including with medicinal marijuana. Um, I can tell you from the standpoint, um, and we will speak further on that, um, it, it's very risky to do. As always during pregnancy, we want to check with our healthcare providers before doing anything. And if we have any doubts, it's always best to err on the side of caution, maybe get a second opinion, um, really follow your gut um, and, and be as safe as we can um, during that pregnancy. All right. We also know that pregnancy with substance use is, is very stigmatized. And women will often, people who are pregnant will not seek out um, even talking about it or airing their concerns for fear of being judged and penalized. There's also a fear of DCPMP, and we're going to talk about that for a little bit as well. Um, I'll get back to that in a little bit. We also have to worry about reduced prenatal care because folks who are using are much less likely to. Um, get prenatal care, and we know that that can result in poor birth outcomes for both mom and for the baby. Even if folks are getting prenatal care, again, often they're not truthful. It's very difficult when you're asked questions like, you're not smoking, are you? You're not using any drugs, are you? Um, those are real close-ended. People are going to say no. Who wants to hear it? Um, but it makes sense, but they're uncomfortable questions to ask. Um, people are also worried about being punished versus being offered support and, and compassion. We're working very hard uh, to change that with all systems of care. Luckily, I think we are seeing some change. We have a lot of great supports for women that we did not have in the past. We strongly need more research. There is not enough research to know um, outcome, I'm sorry, long-term effects um, that, that could be just devastating. We don't even know. We know it's not a good idea for a lot of reasons, and we have some research, but even without the long-term research, which we need, we, we only can recommend that everyone err on the side of caution. There is no safe amount that should be used at any time during pregnancy. We also need to really be concerned about that second and third hand smoke. Um, it does cause a lot of breakdown of oxygen being sent to the fetus, um, and it really can cause a lot of damage in different places. Um, this is a list of, of just some of the things that, that can be really um, present as difficulties for both a pregnant woman as well as her unborn child. Um, there's a high risk of, of miscarriage. We, we know about the toxicity to the respiratory system, the immune system, the higher risk of COVID, of course. We have to worry a lot about hypotension, that oxygen flow, whether we're talking cigarette smoking or marijuana. Um, 
Deliveries can be prolonged or arrested where they just stop. And we have to worry about placental complications where the placenta can actually tear away from the uterine wall and mom can ha hemorrhage um, during her delivery. And of course, that's not um, safe as at all. Our little ones really can have small birth weight, small brain, small head, developmental problems. The um, newborns may show an increased startle response, tremors, have just disturbed sleep patterns. And all of this is indicative of difficulty with um, self-soothing and um, self-regulation and emotional regulation, which can lead to a lot of other difficulties. There can be risk for cognitive and behavioral problems, as well as that substance use and mental health uh, concerns that we talked about already. Lastly, there is also an increased risk of childhood cancer. Now, when we're talking about parenting, you know, we have to remember, okay, the, the kids are in bed. It's okay to have a glass of wine, smoke or joint, do whatever it is we feel like doing to relax. But always um, as preventionists and, and we want to be thinking about harm reduction, harm reduction and keeping everyone safe is we do have to worry how much are you using? Is there another adult in the house in case you do become a little more inattentive or neglectful or fall asleep? Um, or maybe you're not paying as much attention to your little one and as, as you might um, prior to having that glass of wine, whatever um, the situation may be, it's, it, it's really helpful to know that there's going to be another caretaker if you are choosing to indulge socially just in terms of harm reduction. Okay, um, plans of safe care. Th uh, this is really important. I do want to spend a moment speaking of this. I know this is difficult to see on the slide, but if you go on the DCF website, it's very easy to pull up the plans of safe care. It's, it's very easy to negotiate to write off the title page. But I want to talk about this a little bit in terms of Marijuana now as a legal substance. When we're talking about pregnancy, um, a woman who, a pregnant woman person who tests positive for marijuana um, is in a position for automatic reporting to DCPNP. Um, the protocol, whether we are talking marijuana or any other illicit substance is that DCP and P will be called in for further screening and assessment. I do want to point out that with DCP and P entering the picture does not mean that a case file is open. It means that they're there to check out and see what support systems, what services, what issues, what challenges may be in place, and see what can be done to offer as much support to that pregnant person, that new parenting person, to keep mom and baby together at if possible, so they, you know, we can secure bonding and permanency and security and safety. So please keep that in mind. However, it's important for a mom to report up front. So if you have any interaction with pregnant women, women in any sphere of influence in your lives, and if they are using uh, medicinal marijuana because um, their um, prenatal provider recommended it to come back some of um, the discomforts of early pregnancy, or maybe she's using CBD products that she thinks has no THC in it, but maybe it does. This is important to talk about with the prenatal care provider and all other supports because it should be reported. If it's reported ahead of time, Things are viewed very differently, of course, than if mom gets caught off guard as she goes into labor and delivery, um, a drug screen is done, she tests positive, and all of a sudden DCPMP is there. Scary, traumatic, we, we would prefer to avoid that from happening. This plan, um, these plans of safe care also talk about um, those pregnant uh, persons who are on MAT and the importance of staying on there, the medication-assisted treatment. It's critical women don't go off opiates uh, at all during pregnancy, and MAT is the gold standard of care. 
um, DCP if he wants to promote that and support that. So moms who are dealing with substance use concerns, they're going to be helped to engage in services and treatments. And that as long as that person is, is doing that, um, there's such a better chance for mom and baby to have healthy outcomes and to be able to remain unified. Additionally, if, if um, a pregnant person is on some type of amphetamine for whatever um, other coexisting um, condition exists, that too needs to be reported ahead of time Otherwise, it can create a misperception when DCP and P comes in. We also want to alert, um, you know, the, the staff working in labor and delivery, right? Because we don't want our uh, delivering people to, to be stigmatized and to be judged. Um, it's good to know the information up front, what they're struggling with, or if they're on something prescription that just needs to be reported ahead of time. Um, this brochure, it is downloadable, it is printable. Um, we can get you hard copies if this is something any of you are interested in having in any of your agencies. It also includes a lot of helpful resources, which is the page I left up. Um, it really from New Jersey Family Helpline um, to um, women specific services, legal services. Um, Lot, lots of helpful things. So please know that the Plans of Safe Cares is, is in existence and it is mandatory reporting if uh, a mom is using any type of marijuana product during uh, her pregnancy. Okay, this is the other page of the same brochure. Again, with the medicinal, there's that perception of safety. Um, folks are using it for pain, nausea, trouble sleeping, etc. I empathize, been there myself with pregnancy. I know, know it can be um, unpleasant, but um, as a healthcare provider, as a person in education, um, in prevention, I need to help um, folks think about maybe alternatives, like what other ways maybe could you talk with your nutritionist or your, your healthcare provider about increasing your appetite, reducing your nausea, getting better sleep, those types of things. We really want the message to be very clear that we discourage any use of any marijuana or other substances at least 30 days prior um, to um, trying to start a family. Um, and certainly um, once pregnancy is known to please stop using all substances during and after pregnancy. Um, we, we really just want to get that information out there. And this is really supported by the American uh, Pediatrics, of course, American Academy um, of Oncology and Gynecology, the National Institute of Health, Center for Disease Control. Uh, we really advise no use. Um, and those are the recommendations more research, we just don't know. Um, so we really want to err on the side of, of caution. We'd like everyone educated about the danger, possible dangers of marijuana use. We'd like all women to be asked, uh, before you knew you were pregnant, how was your use? Tell me, are you using now? What's going on? Tell me about that. It's really okay to ask the questions. Um, if it's part of conversation, it's not judgmental. It's, it's really wonderful to elicit that information. And if anybody comes across any um, positive where you might be working with a person who is pregnant and may be dealing with some substance use concerns, we are the people to speak to um, at the um, perinatal, uh, excuse me, perinatal addiction prevention project um, within our agency. During breastfeeding, okay, it, it's very trace what shows up in breast milk. Um, we don't notice really any fetal effects other than uh, babies may be a little more sleepy, so they might not suck as well during feeding, which could impact their um, ability to gain weight. Um, but again, we need to think about parenting concerns, safe sleep, right? Uh, sharing bed while breastfeeding is never safe. Um, if someone's used and then they're breastfeeding while lying in bed with their baby, there is more risk of rolling over, suffocating, um, that little one falling asleep. There will be less production of breast milk. That's um, important to get to get uh, across. And remember, it's going to stay in the baby system a really long time. And we are 
always concerned about later development of cognitive and behavioral uh, problems. Okay, so if we're thinking about risk reduction, uh, we really want folks who have of reproductive age and those pregnant, those newly parenting, please stay away from second and third hand smoke at all points. Um, this can really, really help reduce um, some serious risks for poor outcomes for both mom and their, their little ones. Um, and please, no using during breastfeeding. There's actually breast strips now uh, for women to test their breast milk. Um, if they're choosing to socially drink alcohol um, and still want to breastfeed, they can check if there's still any alcohol in their breast milk. Um, as of right now, there's no such thing for marijuana. And remember, it does stay in fat cells a really long time. So even if you haven't smoked or smoked much and it's been hours, um, it still could be lingering within your, within your fat cells within your breasts. So please keep that in mind. Um, as we're talking with people about their use, please let's try to remember um, to use those open-ended questions. You know, let's talk about maybe your past use, present use, how about your partner's use. Again, um, just part of conversation. Um, if we talk about these things routinely, they can get comfortable. Um, women don't mind being asked. We really don't. We like sharing information. We want to be healthy as long as, as we feel that um, what we're saying is okay and, and that the person we're speaking with seems approachable. Um, and certainly it's okay to say, you know what, um, as I work with people in whatever capacity, I ask this of everybody. Because as the more I know, you know, the more I'll, I'll be able to be of service. So uh, um, again, if you have, um, um, we'll go back to this, any concerns, questions, um, any supports you would like for yourself, anybody you know in any sphere of influence in your life, please feel free to reach out to us at the consortia. My number and my email is listed here, um, and certainly we can make it available to everybody. Um, I will ask if folks don't mind to take a moment to complete our survey. The state is asking us to collect a little bit of information about whether um, what we're putting out there is um, helpful or not. In the, in the honor of time, maybe, um, Ebony, we can send this out later again for folks to fill out um, so we can get that back um, and get some responses for that. That would be great because I really don't want to take up time. Um, I added many resource references. If people have any interest in learning anything more, I know I went through a lot of information in a very short amount of time. Uh, but um, I hope that this was helpful, and if anything, just for some harm reduction, and to really think about the, the concerns this really can um, can really put forth for developing brains, whether you know we're talking about in utero or during our, our growing years for our young folks. Um, so with that, I, I think we're okay on time. I'll yes, turn it back right over right. to Ebony um, so we can hear from Jerry. Thank you. Thank you so much, Debbie, for that fantastic presentation. I do realize that I uh, did not get to give your bio, so I just want everyone to know a little bit more about you before we continue on to Jerry. So everyone, Debbie began her career as an occupational therapist with a clinical focus on psychiatry and addiction. And once certified as an addiction counselor, Debbie switched from, from clinical work to prevention and education. And for the past 15 years, she has served as program manager for the Perinatal Addiction Prevention Project at Central Jersey Family Health Consortium. And during this time, Debbie has earned certifications as tobacco treatment, as a tobacco treatment specialist, state educator for fetal alcohol spectrum disorders, and as a women's treatment specialist. So, and Debbie, I will share that survey if you wanna share that with me, um, or you can put it in the chat. Um, and then without further ado, we will go over to Jerry and just a little bit about Jerry before she begins. Jerry is currently the Senior Development Director at Prevention Resources, and she started her career in prevention in 2008 as a prevention educator and is now the Director of the Safe Communities Coalition in Hunterdon and Somerset County. Where most of her, where most of her time is spent on community level change strategies, collaboration to reduce substance misuse on prescription drugs, alcohol, marijuana, and tobacco. 
And I want to thank you again, Jerry, for being with us. And I'm going to hand it over to you. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I appreciate being invited here today. So thank you again. And Debbie, really great information. Um, so thank you for sharing that as well. So my part of the program, um, I'm going to be speaking a little bit more about some of the regulations and policies that have been put in place since legalization of adult use marijuana, as well as I'll be going over um, understanding the impact marijuana has on a youth's developing brain, as well as polysubstance use, and really talking about, about addiction, because this is really... We talk a lot about marijuana, alcohol, and um, opioids, pain medicines, fentanyl, but it's really all it comes down to one thing, addiction. And we're becoming a society that is addicted to many substances. Jerry, if I may interrupt for one moment. Yes. We can't see your entire slide. We can see one slide and your notes, if that's what you're intending. I just wanted to let you know. Okay, no, that's not what I was attending. Um, let me see if I can fix this. And to fix that, I think go to, yep, display settings. Uh, and it will be, mm -hmm. Is that better? Yes, thank okay. you. Yep, good, thank you. I missed one wow. step. I mean, I, I did practice, but I missed a step. No problem. So, um, the first uh, thing that we're going to talk about today is some policies. So. Marijuana today is legal for those that are 21 and older to use. However, it's not legal if you're buying it off the street. It is only illegal if you buy it from a licensed dispensary. And a lot of people don't realize that. It is still illegal for any youth to use any type of marijuana at all. So I was asked to talk a little bit today about workplace policies. So if you check out my first screen here, you know, we have words all over the place. And it's kind of like that's the way the policy is working right now. We don't have a really comprehensive, complete policy or regulations from the Cannabis Regulatory Commission. So it's something that's going to be ever changing. One of the most difficult parts that they're having with this policy is that it's hard to measure, um, you know, if somebody's under the influence of, of marijuana. Um, we could do drug screens but it's now legal. We have medical use, it's legal. So it's a really tricky spot that some of these um, workplace workplaces um, are having difficulty trying to come up with a policy that works for everyone. So one of the things that they are talking about is a wire, which is a workplace impairment recognition expert, similar to when we had a DRE, which is a drug um, recognition recognition expert, that's a police officer um, that typically gets called onto the scene of a car crash or if um, someone's been pulled over and they do um, kind of like a sobriety test on the side of the road, looking at different changes in the person, their, their eyes, their pupils, their coordination. So it's not a full study where you could take um, an alcohol test and see what the alcohol level is. So that's some of the issues that they're having with it, with um, getting workplace policies in place. So some of the things that some work work um, places are doing, businesses are implementing their own policies. One of the we are being told that they suggest that instead of looking and saying someone's impaired um, by the use of marijuana kind of check to see, are they doing their job? Are they coming to work late? Are they um, get you know, do, is their work um, lax, laxing, lax in work, sorry. Um, also, as well as, you know, if they're getting into accidents or causing accidents at work. So it's very difficult right now to say that we have a complete workplace policy. So hopefully, some changes will be coming down where it will be more concrete regulations that businesses can follow. So the Cannabis Regulatory Commission recently passed uh, cannabis con consumption rooms, which are coming soon. So there aren't any in place as of right now, but they will be coming soon. The one good thing that 
besides having um, state approval from the CRC that you can have it, the municipality also has to have an ordinance or regulations in place saying that that's okay to have a consumption room. Consumption rooms can be either indoor or outdoor. Um, I have a picture here of indoor and it, they are supposed to comply with the Smoke-Free Air Act, which also includes any type of vaping. So we'll, we'll have to see how this all plays out. As of right now, we don't have any um, in place. So you can bring in your own food or that you can um, have food delivered, but you cannot sell food on site. You can purchase marijuana from the dispensary. Typically these cannabis consumption rooms um, will be attached in a separate area from where you can purchase the marijuana. However, if you have a, hold a medical marijuana card, you're able to bring your own um, dash or your own marijuana, edibles, gummies, whatever you have. So there's a little trouble there to see how are they going to enforce that and how are they going to check that. If you leave the consumption room, you must have a sealable package. You can't just walk out with the product or you need to leave it there and it'll be destroyed. Um, again, the bud tenders, this is what they call them, um, serving and watching, they're responsible to make sure that, that people that are consuming are um, not over consuming. So again, there's a lot to be seen as to how all of this is going to work out and how it's going to um, look. So here's some pictures of designs that they were talking about doing down in Atlantic City. At the top right, you can see that that's an outdoor site. Any outdoor sites need, needs to be enclosed. Um, this one has glass so you can see through it. Um, and it also says that you can, um, you can see a bar to the left. Typically they're not supposed to serve, so I don't know how that's going to work. And also for the indoor um, bar area as well, you can see on the bottom left is their indoor consumption room. So it needs to be away from other areas. Rooms need to be properly ventilated. And the CRC, which is the, again, the Cannabis Regulatory Commission, they will come in and check to make sure that all these policies um, are in place and that you have, they have the proper um, ventilation. One of the biggest fears that we have um, about these consumption rooms is drink, um, drug driving. So marijuana in your system while you're driving. So I wanted to just show you this map and um, I do apologize. You see Branchburg is in yellow, that should be white. Um, so this shows the uh, Somerset County municipalities um, that have opted in or out for ordinances of having a marijuana or any of the licenses in their business. So I want you to keep in mind that it doesn't mean that these places will have um, dispensaries or cultivating or manufacturing. It's just that they have opted in. The yellow signifies that it's a partial opt-in. So a partial opt-in could mean they only opted in to have um, a retail license or a wholesale license. Um, the red signifies that they've opted into all six licenses. When you, if you look at Franklin Township, you could see that there's a lot of dots on there. So there's 68. So what that represents is that there have been 68 licenses approved. I wanna be clear on this because um, some people misinterpret that this map looks like, oh, that's where you know, they have um, retail establishments or wholesale establishments or dis distribution. This just re represents that there's a potential for having these businesses in Franklin. So currently opened in Somerset, we have two. The first one at the top, you can see it's called Block and you can see some of the advertising already. It says, welcome to the Block Somerset, New Jersey meet the new kid on the block. This is a corporate owned um, establishment and they have many stores across um, 
across in New Jersey and as well as other states. On the bottom is Valley Wellness. And this is in Raritan and oh, I'm sorry, the block is also in Franklin Township. It's right on Easton Avenue. Valley Wellness is on uh, 202, 206 by where Unita Appliance um, was. And as you can see on the bottom left, the owner of this estab establishment is um, cutting the ribbon with her children and her husband. So, and these are some of the pictures that you can see. So a lot of these shops that are opening up, it, you could see they look very much like a boutique um, or a very nice establishment. The windows on the outside are typically, um, you can't see inside. And also there's no signage on the outside. It might say, Valley Wellness, but it won't say anything about purchasing um, marijuana. So that's one of the good policies that New Jersey has been a little bit, has been stricter on compared to some other states across the country. And at the bottom right, you see people that are signing in to register. So. We're now gonna um, switch over to some of the um, dispensaries and we're gonna talk a little bit about um, what, what can be purchased in our community. I'm not sure if anybody's heard of Delta 8 um, THC, but this is a product that is legal. It's 0.3% um, THC, which falls under the Hemp Act. And I'm just gonna show you a really quick video to what is available right now where you can get at convenience stores, gas stations, vape shops. Um, so these are some of the products that our youth are starting to use that we're starting to see in the schools. Delta-8 THC is a psychoactive chemical compound called a cannabinoid. It is found in small traces in the hemp and cannabis plants. It is chemically similar to Delta-9 THC, or more commonly known as marijuana, and creates a mental high. Because Delta-8 doesn't appear in hemp with enough volume to extract and use, Delta-8 products are made synthetically from hemp and put through a process often using toxic chemicals. This psychoactive compound became federally legal with an amendment to the 2018 Farm Bill. Under the 2018 Farm Bill, Delta-8 products cannot contain more than 0.3% THC, but that amount can still give users a high, giving these products the nickname Weed Light. Since Delta-8 is manufactured from hemp-derived CBD and not directly extracted from the hemp plant, it is still considered to be a controlled substance under law. Delta-8 THC is also not federally regulated, so many products do not indicate how much THC is in them. This can lead to overexposure of THC in adults and especially in youth. Delta-8 THC is easily accessible and can be found for sale at corner stores, grocery stores, vape shops, and online. There are often no warning labels on packages and many products look like candies. Youth may think these products are safe and eat them without knowing what they are. THC overexposure can be dangerous for both adults and youth. National Poison Control Centers received 661 exposure cases of Delta-8 THC in 2021. 18% of those cases required hospitalizations, including children who required intensive care unit admission following exposure to these products. Look at what products you and your kids are buying and make sure they do not contain THC. You may have to look closely to find a warning label or symbol. If you do have Delta-8 products in your home, store them safely in a locked cabinet so youth can't accidentally consume them. Talk to your kids about Delta-8 and the harms of consuming a psychoactive substance as a minor. For more information about Delta-8 and other THC products, visit our website. Okay, so I don't know if you noticed in the top right-hand corner, that picture was from a candy shop um, in, on Somerville, in Somerville on Main Street that showed that they had Delta-8 infused chocolates. 
So we're starting to see this in our communities as advertising, as advertising that they have the Delta 8 um, products in their establishments. So as Debbie um, mentioned before about the new concentrates and the new um, increase in THCs and different ways that people are ingesting marijuana. Back in the day, they pretty much smoked a joint or were able to use a bong. Today, there's many different ways and many different um, concentrates and um, products. Some of these products are used by taking the uh, bud leaf and using the terracones and putting it together with a solvent. And what that does is it releases all the oils and the resins and they strain it and you have a very high level of THC that can range anywhere between 90% and higher. Why this is so concerning for us in our community is because this is what our kids are using today. They are vaping THC um, much more than, than any, any other use as well as using the edibles. And we'll talk a little bit more about the edibles in a few minutes. These are some of the different products. They're dabbing it, which is when they take a small, um, little, just a little bit of the resin or the oil, put it on a um, rid, and then they vape it, or they can use vape pens. They're now, now selling different types of vape pens. This is a picture of a cartridge. The kids are calling them carts. And the reason why they're pre-filled um, when you purchase them, but instead of throwing the whole vape out like a disposable vape pen, you could just change the cartridge and you keep the actual pen. So in the long run, um, it's less expensive for people to purchase the um, cartridges and just change out the resin. So here's just a slide kind of showing what I was just speaking of the then versus now. So back in the day, um, smoked marijuana was probably around 3% in the 90s, a little bit higher. Um, in the early 2000s, around 25% for smoking a joint. And back then in the day, they were doing rolling papers, bongs, um, they called them bubblers or pipes. Those were the most popular ways to ingest. Now we see that there's a whole new different array of products out there, many that are being marketed to our youth. Um, and this shows here that you have uh, between 20 and 95% THC, depending upon what type of product that you're using and how much of that you are using. So here you can see the edibles, the different kinds of vape pens, tinctures, Again, another demonstration for you to get a better understanding that you would have to smoke 50 wood, Woodstock joints to equal one marijuana dab today. So that's a significant change. And in fact, the way the um, concentrates are, they're so strong that you really can't even call them marijuana anymore. It's like a different drug. And that's what is making our kids addicted. So we'll talk a little bit more about that in a little bit. The risks of con consuming edibles. Debbie also had mentioned that there is a delay of um, that high in using edibles. And it you know, depends how much you're using, what kind you're using, um, your size. And it could be anywhere from a half hour to around two hours until you feel the effects. What's happening across the country is that many people aren't feeling it. So they end up taking more and end up overdosing on the marijuana. We're seeing a huge in, um, uptick in young children that have um, been taken to the hospital for marijuana use um, by eating gummies that were left around. So actually I was in um, at the Franklin Township Youth Center a few weeks ago doing a presentation and one of the kids asked a question about edibles and um, a mom in the audience said, do you mind if I answer that question? And I, I was you know, like, sure, of course. So what happened was her daughter was at a sleepover with some friends and she ate some gummies and she didn't know and she started not feeling well. So she called her mom, her mom came and picked her up. And when she got home, she was just really feeling horrible, nauseous, um, 
very lethargic. Um, so her mother ended up taking to the hospital and they tested her and she actually tested positive for THC in her system. So one of the messages that we're trying to get across to our youth is you really don't know what you're getting uh, when somebody hands you something, whether it's a, a, a pill, um, a brownie, a cookie, you really, really have no idea what you're taking. And so we suggest, you know, not even once, don't try it. And you get your candy from someone that you know, because like your parents or um, at home, because you just don't know what you're, when you're, what you're getting out, even if they are your friends. Some of the effects include anxiety and panic attacks, agitation, respiratory depression, and impaired mo motor ability. So this um, is another short video, and this is all of, it's about addiction. And this is what concerns um, us as prevention the most, because of all of these products that are being um, changed and manipulated into other products or stronger products or different products, carry a lot of the um, drug, the um, synthetics that make you high and that will also um, harm, harm your brain. So the younger you are when you start using a substance, the more likely you are to become addicted to that substance. So we'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute, but this will give you a good bird's eye view of what we're talking about as far as addiction is concerned. Say the word addiction, and drugs such as alcohol, heroin, and cocaine often come to mind. But other substances like nicotine, marijuana, and prescription pain medications can also be addictive. So can certain activities such as gambling and sex. Whatever the case, addiction involves craving and a loss of control, with the substance use or activity continuing even if it causes harm. This can include problems with relationships, jobs, school, money, or your health. Addiction is not due to weakness or a lack of willpower. Instead, it's a chronic disease involving changes in the brain. There, billions of nerve cells or neurons communicate through a series of signals and chemical messengers. When messages leave one neuron, they attach to a receptor on the receiving one, like a key fitting into a lock. In addiction, this communication process is disrupted. Large amounts of a brain chemical called dopamine are released, overwhelming receptors and resulting in the high that people experience. To keep that feeling going, they take the drug or engage in the behavior again and again. Eventually, the brain changes and adapts, driving them to seek out more just to get the same feeling. That's called tolerance. Stopping a substance can cause withdrawal symptoms such as nausea, tremors, depression, or severe anxiety. Taking too much of a substance or a combination of substances can result in an overdose and serious illness, or even death. Young people are especially vulnerable to addiction. The impulse control center of their brains, known as the prefrontal cortex, isn't fully developed, making them more prone to risky behavior. And using substances can cause lasting harm to their developing brains. If you think your child might be experimenting with substances, talk to them about it. Parents can help by taking a strong stand against substance use and teaching their kids healthier ways to deal with life stresses. Like any other disease, such as diabetes or asthma, addiction can be successfully treated. So if you or someone you know has a problem with addiction, talk to your doctor, a mental health professional, or an addiction specialist. Getting help may save a life. With that video, it really tells a story that any substance, especially to a growing brain, um, can really add to the risk of becoming addicted to that medication or, or marijuana. We know we have cannabinoids already in our brain and the recept, cannabinoid receptors. And when you introduce marijuana to those receptors, they're gonna like it, get a great high, and then they're gonna keep wanting more and more and more building up that tolerance until, until they're in full-blown addiction. Some of the other concerns that we're having is drug driving. Like I mentioned earlier, there's really no test when someone's pulled over other than having a DRE on hand to check to see um, any changes in their physical and um, behaviors. So right now we're seeing an uptick in um, 
car crashes. So I'm gonna just read this one because this is a really important slide to see the changes in the last few years. So the first part is intoxicated drivers buzzed on booze and drugs are now the leading cause of fatal traffic crashes in New Jersey. In 2021, 697 people were killed in 667 crashes, the highest fatality since 2007. Intoxication, both alcohol and drugs, was the top contributing factor. In 210 fatal crashes in 2021, a 30% of a 30% increase. For the first time ever, the analysis separated the numbers of crashes where drivers, pedestrians, and cyclists tested positive for cannabis. It showed 91 drivers, 13 passengers, and 23 pedestrians and two cyclists tested positive for cannabis after fatal crashes. The other uptick that we're seeing is, you know, I mentioned um, polysubstance use. Most people aren't just using one product and they're starting to see in some of these fatal car crashes that there is also alcohol in their system. What happens is when you mix alcohol with marijuana, it intensifies the high. However, if someone gets pulled over and they get tested for um, alcohol, their BAC level still may be under the limit. However, their actions are not, they're more impaired. So it's a very dangerous um, place to be on the road and it really impacts all of us. So the impact on teens' life and marijuana use disorder. So some people still don't really think that marijuana is addicting. They don't think that it's harmful. And again, we're talking about today's marijuana. We're not talking about the casual adult, occasional adult user. We're talking about our youth. Um, it's priming their brain for addiction. There's an increase in mental health issues. There's an at risk for developing psychoses or bringing out psychoses. There's been associations with marijuana and schizophrenia. We talked about impaired driving, lower grades in school, um, not wanting to go to school, not completing um, homework, and they're less likely to participate in sports, school activities, changing friends, um, maybe a change in showering. So these are some of the things that we're um, seeing with, with our youth today. Now, all, most of the schools that we've been talking to in um, throughout Somerset County have indicated that there's been a huge increase in marijuana use in the schools, and they're they're very concerned about this. Um, some of the um, let's see, okay. And one of the other things that we have been seeing is something called hyperpermesis, or another easier word to use is scrometing. So people that are using, and this could happen in adults as well as youth, for chronic users who are using the high concentrates um, can have this, uh, this thing called scrometing, which um, is severe vomiting and severe stomach pain at the same time. Most people have ended up going to the ED because they have no idea what's going on with them. Um, they are diagnosing this at a very high rate as they, the more that they have been learning about this disease. At first, it was really difficult to diagnose, but now um, it's getting a lot easier because people are coming in more often with these symptoms. So what are some of the things that we can do as a community, as parents, um, to make some of these changes? Um, so as far as prevention, and so, don't want to see our kids getting addicted to yet another drug. Um, we know that when you legalize a drug, the perception of harm goes way down, but the usage rates go up. And as I said before, we're starting to already see that, um, um, see that in our schools across the region. So edu school education is very important. Definitely needs to be supported on the community level as well as um, at home as well. Um, so we talk about doing prevention is evidence using evidence-based programs here in Somerset County. Some of the programs that we have are footprints, life skills, preventure that um, we can use for as a prevention to starting to use substances. Marketing. Marketing is really important because the marijuana companies are taking a book out of the tobacco companies 
and they are marketing to our youth. They come out with products that are attractive to youth. Um, they always show pictures or videos with people having a really great time. They're colorful. They come in all types of flavors. Um, New Jersey has gone ahead and they did ban um, the flavors. However, they didn't go far enough and they're able to purchase single um, vape pens that are, are flavored. And I'm talking about the nicotine and the, um, the nicotine liquids. So we really want them to understand that the reason why they've made these products and targeting our youth is because they'll be lifelong users and they have money and they're more vulnerable to the marketing and more curious to wanna to start using some of these um, different types of drugs. Social media, all over the place, uh, very easy to get on a website and to um, you know, be able to look up and purchase what you're looking for. Snapchat is a big place where kids are using um, that are go that they're going on there to purchase some of these um, THC products. The THC levels, like I explained, are very high. Uh, drug driving impact on the brain, and you know one of the best ways to talk to talk to the youth is to find out you know what are their goals. You know, do they want to play sports? Are they a musician? Do they want to go to college? Or you know, work in a, you know start their work workforce life. Um, that's some of the ways that we can get them to think in a different way as far as um, not using a substance, not, not even once. Um, so. This is a positive social norm campaign that we did with um, tobacco. Um, so these are some really good positive ways to get the kids involved and to get more buy-in rewards for making good choices instead of getting suspended for those that um, are getting in trouble, in trouble, give rewards out to, to our youth. Student of the Month is a really great program. I've seen it in both Somerset and, and in Hunterdon County where a um, teacher or someone in the school has seen a student doing something positive and they get rewarded for that. Um, there's a natural high and I choose programs where you can be on the positive side again and natural high running, music, um, volunteering, you know, same thing with the I choose campaign. You can word it any way you'd like, but it's really important to get these positive messages out that not everyone is using substances. Peer to peer and pledging, which I talked about before, nicotine, vaping, marijuana, and alcohol free. Policies. So this is what um, the Safe Communities Coalition in Hunter and Somerset County work mostly on developing policies that will bring about community level change to everyone. This is in conjunction with providing information um, and other um, ways of getting that information out there. So we wanna layer it. So across uh, Somerset County, we've had breathe easy signs. You may see them at some of the schools. The difference is that this now has a marijuana leaf on there. So you could see a smoked cigarette, a vape pen and a marijuana leaf to let people know that marijuana is not allowed um, on these properties as well as in our parks. The middle campaign is if you drive different, you feel different. Or if you feel different, you drive different. Sorry about that. So this is a billboard, um, an electronic billboard that can be seen um, on Route 202. And this is another way of putting, getting that information out there in a very easy way. One of the things that we really are talking about, if you have marijuana in your home, lock it up. I know Debbie mentioned that sometimes people might want to have some marijuana at night, you know, to relax, but we want to make sure that our kids, our pets, and our families are safe. So we want to make sure that we have ways to lock it up. Drug driving policies, some of them that we've changed is implementing um, marijuana into the drug driving programs and the alcohol programs for driver's education, parent teen programs. And we are, um, our coalition is in the process of working with the driving schools. So when they are working with youth, um, they can hand out some of this information so to 
so the kids will um, understand about marijuana and driving. With a lot of our surveys that we have seen over the last few years coming out of RVCC and some of our high schools is that kids will say that they have a very high perception of harm for alcohol, so drunk driving, but a very low perception that it's bad to um, drive under the influence. That it's okay, I mean, I'm sorry, that it's okay to drive under the influence of marijuana. Comprehensive school policies. Um, many of our schools are amending their smoking policies and added, have added vaping already and marijuana, vape pens. They're very comprehensive as these policies not only are for the students and faculty, but also for any visitors that come um, onto campus, school campuses. Alternatives to suspension. Uh, this is something that some schools are trying to work on instead of suspending the kids, make sure that they get the help that they need. Screening tools like SBIRT are being used across the region, um, student assistance counselors and signage, which we talked about earlier. So you might say, why are we having this picture of counterfeit drugs when we're doing a marijuana presentation? And this is the reason. There's not really there's not really one single drug that people are using. A lot of times when they are in trouble, there's many um, drugs in their system, marijuana, alcohol, and other drugs may be present. The reason why this slide is so important is because today things have changed. We had fentanyl, now we have xylazine. These are very dangerous drugs and very deadly. So in the past, I used to, I always call it the natural progression of experimentation. Kids might smoke a cigarette, might have a little alcohol, and they progress to the next drug. And some who find that, you know, we're at risk and become addicted to some of these drugs will move on to heavier drugs. Now we're seeing that kids are buying and people are buying these counterfeit drugs off of the internet or getting them from a friend, thinking they're um, a natural or thinking that it might be an oxycodone or some other drug. And we just don't know what's in it. So we're finding that some of you know kids are dying. And it's really scary because it's it's you have one choice, and we're hoping that one choice is not even to try it even once for any of these drugs. But this is a really important message for everyone to understand and to get out that if someone gives you you think you might be taking an aspirin, don't take it unless it's uh, something that you get from your home, from the bottle that you know that it was um, bought and um, or from a doctor for some of these other drugs and that was prescribed for you. So um, two things here, this is the help app and the help app is, um, an app that's a free app where, where what we would love kids to download this app. And it has all kinds of resources on there for our youth. We have county resources, state resources, and federal resources. So it might be on mental health, it might be on bullying, and it's very easy to use. And all you have to do is when you open it up, you want to go to mental health, you hit mental health and it'll have mental health resources. So it'll have some Somerset resources in there, um, as well. So it's a really good tool to have really for anybody um, that you might find that you're in need for. So it could be for substance use, it could be also for domestic violence. There's a, a whole bunch of information on there. So that's the end of my presentation. Um, I also do have a survey as well. I'm sorry to bombard you guys with surveys today, but they are important to the work that we do. So if you wouldn't mind, um, there's the QR code, and then we'll take um, some questions. And I just wanted to, um, just before I leave though, I wanted to read something that came out last week by Senator Cory Booker. So Senator Cory Booker was a real proponent for legalizing mar adult use marijuana in the state of New Jersey. He recently um, came out with this. Um, Senator Cory Booker, who was a long champion of the federal legalization of cannabis, identified marijuana as a dangerous drug that requires further research. This is a drug, and I think it is a dangerous drug. I really do. If you have a child or if you have a young or if you are younger than the age of 25, 
and you're drinking or smoking pot, you are damaging your brain in ways that will severely affect your mental health, the well being of your brain. So, this is really a positive message coming from Senator Cory Booker. Um, some of the things that we've been saying in prevention for a very long time, um, they're now starting to see. So, we expect that we are going to see marijuana rates rise with our youth. Right now, they're holding steady, um, but we're looking very closely at that data as we go on. So thank you very much, and time for Q&A. Thank you very much, Jerry, and thank you very much, Debbie, for your presentation. We greatly appreciate you being here today and sharing your insight into this important topic as we learn more about it and more research comes out. And with respect to everyone's opinions and to uh, continue on, uh, we will be answering some questions. I did take note for a few that came up in the chat during the presentation. So we'll have a few minutes for those. So the first question I have here is, and either Jerry or Debbie, you can uh, chime in for this. Can secondhand smoke be dangerous in a child? Um, Jerry, if you want to take it or either way. Can you repeat that? I'm sorry, Ebony. Can secondhand smoke be dangerous to a child? Yes. So if we're talking about secondhand smoke from either cigarettes or marijuana, they're both combustible products and any um, type of chemicals or cancer causing chemicals, yes, are very dangerous in secondhand smoke, as well as with pets. So if pets get into any of these products, um, it can be very harmful to, to them as well. Um, can I also mm -hmm. add to that also the third hand smoke, which is what we don't see. That's the stink, the smell, the actual chemicals that linger on soft surfaces. Um, they are very um, unhealthy and risky for little ones as well as pets. Um, incredibly toxic um, and stuff can linger a minimum of eight hours per surface and um, cleaning doesn't necessarily get rid of things. So what we really encourage no smoking of any type inside, go outside away from open windows and doors. Please wash your hands well before you touch anything when you come in. Maybe even use a smoking jacket, take it off, leave it outside. Where there's smell, there's toxins. Um, so just something to keep in mind. Thank you both. I do have another question from the chat box here. Um, a member would like to know, or participant would like to know, or comment as well. This training is a great myth busting and awareness building session for parents and other caretakers. However, why is this message not being presented at schools to students? In their opinion, students think marijuana is not is non addicting and harmless due to it being legal. If you could share your insight on that. I think we're both working hard to be in the schools, right, Jerry? Uh, we're spread over a lot of counties, uh, but we, we are working hard at it. The good news is um, health classes are talking about it more. We're being brought in as uh, presenters to offer this information with the kids. There's different, and I know Jerry can speak to this. Um, there's so many curriculums and projects and things to help get this out as well. We're trying to reach the parents, we're trying to reach the teachers. So really systemically, we're definitely trying to get this important information out to the kids so they can be empowered with real knowledge and, and make better choices. We're really just trying to get people to understand in the community, as well as students to understand that because of the THC levels that are so high today, that it really is a different drug. And people that may have used um, marijuana or pot in the past will think, well, it wasn't a big deal. You know, I'm okay. I have a good job. You know, I have a family. And they really are not understanding the impact on a youth's brain. The other issue is why kids aren't believing it is, you know, when legal, again, legalization, if there's a drug that's legal, they'll feel like, oh, well, if they made it legal, it can't be all that bad. As well as, you know, the prefrontal cortex where we talk about is the last place that, uh, you know, is developed in um, till around the age 25 or even older. And you know, kids are already making poor decisions without a substance in their body. So thinking that that's not gonna happen to them. 
So decision making isn't always great. Um, being impulsive is very, you know, high up there. So um, they're more likely to experiment with substances. Thank you. And, yeah, and again, we are we are out of the school. We're at pretty much all the schools, and we're in um, you know the community as well. So it's really hard and it's hard to reach the parents, but um, we keep doing it. And, you know, hopefully uh, starting in a younger grade compared to where we did a lot of our work in, you know, mid upper middle schools and in high school, we are now presenting these programs at a much younger age. Is it possible, Jerry or Debbie, that we would be able to share a copy of your presentations to the participants? Certainly, um, I have no issue with that. I do ask though, please complete the survey first um, before having access to that. We really need those surveys, um, you know, to, just so we have that feedback to know that part of what we're doing is effective. Because as everyone's saying, this is so complicated, such a difficult issue. Um, we need to be as effective as we can and, and reach all levels of our communities. Um, with different types of work to, to get this done for our kids. And as a reminder, everyone, we are recording this session and it will be available on the Department of Human Services YouTube page um, uh, at a later date. And that will be announced once it is uh, ready and able to be shared. Let me see what other questions we have here. I did share the survey right in the chat there. If everyone can please, like Debbie said, just take that survey if you have the time today, uh, hopefully before the end of this presentation. Uh, there's a question here with regard to uh, if we know someone that is selling marijuana illegally, can we report them to the police? That's not my area of expertise. I'll let you take that, Jerry. So if someone knows there's um, in Somerset County, they have Crime Stoppers, but they also have Stop It, which is anonymous. Um, where you can call either one of, you know, either um, company they're run through, they're both run through the um, prosecutor's office, and you can anon anonymously um, give them a tip. And typically there's a reward, um, but that's one way that you can absolutely do that. Thank you. And I did see a question here with regard to, uh, just as a general announcement, uh, obtaining the CEU certification or certificate for this presentation uh, to, I believe everyone here has registered for the event. So following the event, if you would send an email to Rena Johnson and I can put her information in the chat box or Zach Berliner, both of their information and they can give you uh, the appropriate information to get your certification um, and credits for attending today's event. Let me see what other questions I have here. We do have some comments. Everyone is loving the presentation. Everything's fantastic. And oh, I do see something here. Someone asked how, if you could explain or shed some light on how marijuana smoke is dangerous how marijuana smoke is dangerous is it? i'm assuming the 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 smoke that is if someone is using it and generally from generally the same way you would use a cigarette in yeah that regard yeah so truly you're talking about that secondhand smoke both jerry and i commented on um, you're replacing one has nicotine in it, which is the addictive piece, right, for cigarette smokers, and the other one has THC in it, um, which is, is the part that is mood altering. Um, there are thousands of cancer causing things that come off burning stuff, whether it's a pipe, a joint, a cigarette. So whether we are talking a marijuana product or a tobacco product, if there's that active smoke, it's filled with thousands of carcinogens and it is breathed in. It is incredibly dangerous. It can cause stillbirth in little ones, sudden infant death syndrome. I, I mean, there's greater risk of stillbirth, um, greater risk of sudden infant death syndrome, greater risk of asthma, 
all the cognitive, behavioral, and developmental problems we've talked about, um, ear infections, hearing loss, it is detrimental. Um, smoke, active smoke coming off a product, just like the, the stuff we can't see, the toxins that um, settle and linger are incredibly cancer causing. And secondhand smoke, no matter what it's coming off of, is now it is categorized as a, as a carcinogen by the FDA. Um, so we're talking real environmental stress um, for passive smokers, you know, anyone who's passively taking that in. And in that same token, we have a question with regard to how we can reach out to our more diverse communities, our diverse communities, as there's been a lot of trouble getting information to them. Uh, how, how may some individuals share that information uh, to the different communities so that not only the youth are aware, but the parents in these communities understand uh, how to talk to their children and how to have these conversations? You know, it's a tall order and always an obstacle. Um, I know we're always working to um, have things offered in as uh, many languages as possible. Um, I can speak for my program. Right now, we do have the capacity to offer in Spanish as well as in English. We do have a bilingual person on our staff. Um, also, our website now has a new feature that Anything you pull up, whether it's information, uh, YouTube, a webinar, an article, it can be translated directly by pushing a button into lots and lots and lots of different languages. So, you know, I think it, it, it's such a challenge. We are so diverse and our communities are so diverse um, that we just need to be as culturally sensitive as we can. And we need to do stuff that appeals to people. So they want to listen um, to maybe what we have to offer and, and to take advantage of services as they become available. Um, so, right, it's meeting people where they at. But so whether we're in family success centers or clinics or hospitals or recreational facilities or youth centers um, or treatment settings, you know, the list goes on. Uh, I, I think we, as all of us in this type of work is we need to infiltrate our communities as much as we can, both on the county level and, of course, all the way up to the state and federal level as well. So not easy, um, but important work. Challenging, yeah. yeah so I, I'm going to speak for, for, for Debbie as well, but um, if anybody's looking for a community program or a school program, you know, reach out to either one of us. Um, and we'll be happy to see what we can do to make sure that this information gets to where it needs to be. Right, we'll go anywhere that will listen to us. That's that's always the point, right? <laughs> Any opportunity, we hate to say no, because you know, um, for a parent, a health provider, a family member, someone to be able to learn something factual that can really matter in a person's life. Um, we want to get that out as much as possible. Thank you very much. And in the interest of time, I know we have a few more conversation um, questions so to throw into the conversation here. Uh, someone would like to know, what do you think is missing from current approaches and measures to educating youth? And do you think current strategies are addressing root causes of the youth utilizing substances as a coping measure? So a two-part question there. Let me know if I need to uh, repeat again. Okay, so um, for the second part, as far as changes in local conditions, um, that's some of the work that we do every day as, as the State Communities Coalition. We look to see where we could take even just one school because one school may have one issue and another school of different part of the county may have another issue, that we make sure that our strategies are data-driven and have a way to be measured. Um, so we looked at look at that and like for like long term strategies, we're looking at that over time. Um, some of the barriers is getting some of that really good um, school data from all of the schools. Um, sometimes that's a little bit of a challenge because not all schools participate in um, school climate surveys. So, you know, that's that's always a barrier. And the first part of the question, um, Ebony. 
The first part was, what do you think is missing from current approaches and measures to educating youth? I think, you know, sometimes it's the buy-in. It's really difficult to get parents to have a buy-in for anything substance related. Um, so that is definitely, you know, more of a challenge and a barrier for us to get that really good information out there. Um, like I said earlier, we are starting younger and younger because it's really important that these kids have basic um, life skills, goal setting, consequences, conflict resolution, understanding stress. You know, we're coming off the epidemic where there is a lot of mental health issues out there. So this all is really very important for prevention of using substances because it's a high rate of people who have mental health issues that are using substances to, um, to cope. And there's healthier coping way, coping ways to cope out there. Um, so that's some of the, you know, things that we need to do to make sure that our kids are healthy from, you know, um, Congress, I mean, Senator Kennedy um, once said it's a checkup from the neck up, you know, we have to ask those mental health questions as well um, to, to help with, you know, our youth. So that's, that's what we need to do, you know, younger and younger parents need to talk often and you know show good examples yeah um and 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 truly we need to make sure our messaging is consistent and i think we need to um make sure our our youth um that they feel respected you know um people want to feel respected and they want to feel safe that they can speak about their concerns and not be judged. And so whether we're talking in schools, healthcare, community-based or religious-based programs, right? I think we're, we're, I like to be optimistic that there, there, you know, we are seeing a paradigm shift where more healthy systems and services and resources are being put in place, but it's an ongoing thing. Um, our, our kids need us more and more every day because their challenges are, are just getting so much greater every single day. Um, so we need to help a whole, whole communities be healthy, right? So that we can really work with our kids. So it's so much across the board, sideways, diagonally, I mean, really on all levels. Um, but um, I think one of the, the, the things that's most impactful is when we can reach as many diverse communities in different places, different professions, different consumers, all different, you know, different people across the spectrum, because that's who represents folks dealing with these substance use concerns. Um, it's everybody. Absolutely. It takes a lot of partnering and collaboration. Like I always like to say, teamwork makes the dream work. And that's why we are here and we're doing what we're doing. And I thank the both of you, Debbie and Jerry, for being with us today. As we close here, I want to let everyone know to look out for the next Human Services Academy. Rena Johnson will be sending out that information. And thank you for letting me be your host today. And hopefully we'll see you again very soon. Thank you for everyone's time today. Yeah, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Be well, everyone.